Hi everyone and welcome to another video from BioTeach, this time looking at protein synthesis. I had a couple of requests to cover this topic from students. Before you watch this video, please make sure you have a good understanding of amino acid structure, how peptide bonds form in proteins, and the primary to secondary to tertiary to quaternary structure of proteins, as this solid foundation will help you grasp this topic much quicker. Now, whilst this topic was requested by an A-level student, this topic does also come up in the BTEC Applied Science in Unit 11, which is the Genetics and Genetic Engineering Unit. So please make sure that you share this with your friends who are doing the BTEC Applied Science as well. So the first thing we have to understand is what the genetic code is and how we can get from that to proteins. So the genetic information for the assembly of amino acids is stored in our DNA and is stored as a three base sequence. These three letters on the mRNA eventually will code for amino acids and each of those three base sequences are called codons. Each codon represents one of the 20 amino acids used to make proteins. The code is effectively known as being universal, which means it is the same in all living things with a few minor exceptions. The genetic code is summarized in an mRNA amino acid table, as you can see on your screen now, which identifies the amino acid encoded by each mRNA codon. To work out which amino acid is coded for by a codon, you would look for the first letter of the codon in the columns, and this is the first base. Then you would look for the intersecting row, which has the second base, and then you'd look for the third intersection, which is the third base. It's probably better to use an example, so let's look at one now. Let's say the codon on our mRNA was AAA. -A -A. So the first base is A, and I found the column for that. The second base is also A, and I found the row for that. And the third base is also A. So what I've done over here is I've highlighted them in that green circle. So where that third base is, I would simply read across over to the left, where I can identify where the codon is and identify the amino acid that corresponds to it is lysine. Let's do another one. Let's say our first base is G, our second base is U, and our third base is C. The amino acid that you would get from G, U, C is valine. That's been circled in that turquoise circle there. You might want to pause the video at this stage to work out a few practice ones yourself. When I teach this to my students, a few of them often get confused with the table format. So I also provide something known as a codon wheel, which looks a bit like this. This format might be easier to handle. You start off in the center and work your way outwards to identify the amino acid for your codon. So let's say you have the first base as G, that's in that kind of maroony circle that you can see. Let's say the second one was a C in that kind of blue circle, and then the last one was the A. This would give you the amino acid of alanine. Let's try another. Let's say you had C, then G, then C again. Well, that would give you arginine. So hopefully that makes sense. I do really like this activity in class. It's super fun to do to practice coding for proteins and usually helps you understand the base pairing with a bit more ease. So feel free to pause the video now and practice a few of your own. There are a few important points to kind of note about the genetic code at this stage. The first point is looking at the fact that the code is known as being degenerate. This means that there's often more than one codon for an amino acid. So I'll just take you back to this mRNA amino acid table again. I want you to have a look at the first column on the left hand side and you can see in that red writing that leucine occurs at least six times in that particular table and you can see that each time it's got a different codon. UUA codes for it, so does UUG, CUU, CUC, CUG. At the bottom of that table on the left hand side, you can also see that valine is coded for by four different codes, ranging from GUU, GUC, GUA and GUG. So this is what we mean by degenerate. And as you just cast your eye over that table as I'm speaking, you can see that there's different codes for the same amino acid. So serine has got about six. Threonine has got about four. There's two, at least two of glutamine. There's about four of alanine and so on. So the other point that I want to talk about is the code being universal. I mentioned this earlier. Essentially, it means that the universal code is common amongst all organisms. 
The third point is that the code is non-overlapping. This basically means that one codon follows another and the triplet codes cannot overlap. And there's also two codons known as start and stop codons. The start looks at the start of this gene sequence and the stop looks at the end of the gene sequence. And there's more detail on that on the subsequent slides coming up. So the next thing I want to look at is looking at genes to proteins. Now, gene expression is the process of rewriting a gene into a protein. That's what that means. It involves transcription of DNA into mRNA and translation of the mRNA. So this diagram over here shows you a, a ladder type structure of a DNA molecule. I've tried to simplify this diagram as much as I can so you can visualize things a little bit better. So the gene is bounded by something known as a promoter region, which is labeled on this diagram, or it's known as a start codon, and it's actually upstream of the gene or at the beginning of the gene. The terminator re region is downstream of the gene or towards the end of that particular part of the DNA. Now, these two regions will control transcription by telling the enzyme RNA polymerase where to start and stop transcription of the gene. Essentially, these certain triplet codes are used to tell a cell when to start and stop the production of a protein. In this diagram, the red lines show where the gene for this protein is on the DNA strand. If we zoom in to this particular region, you will see something a bit like this with the slightly exposed bases. Now, note that the five prime and the three prime ends are labeled with the top strand and the bottom strand. The top strand is something known as the coding strand of the DNA. This strand is not the strand that is transcribed. It is the bottom strand, which runs from the three prime end to the five prime end, which is known as the template strand that is transcribed as part of protein synthesis. The template strand is on the side of the DNA molecule that stores the information that is transcribed into mRNA. It is also known as the antisense strand. So if you see that in textbooks, ensure that you recall that it is the template strand. So I'm just going to describe the stages of transcription here. So that RNA polymerase molecule that you can see in that purple circle will attach to the DNA at the beginning of the gene. RNA polymerase will essentially move through the middle of the split DNA and read the template strand. Each time free bases will attach to the template strand and eventually you get an mRNA strand by complementary base pairing. I just want to highlight at this stage that you've got the complementary base pairing from the template strand that forms the mRNA. So the first three bases or the first codon reads as TAC on the template strand. So that would mean the mRNA will read as AUG. Note how uracil replaces thiamine in the mRNA. And eventually you get all of these bases that are complementary on the mRNA strand. RNA polymerase stops making mRNA when it reaches the stop signal on the DNA molecule. And once the mRNA has been made, the DNA strands that were previously split apart will coil back and the hydrogen bonds will reform. So here you've got your mRNA strand reading from the 5 to 3 direction. You've got your start codon over here of AUG and you've got your stop codon at the end over there of UGA. Each of these triplets of bases is known as a codon. So that's something that you need to ensure that you understand and it needs to be part of your revision notes. Each of these triplets will essentially make an amino acid like you saw with the amino acid table or the codon wheel. So if we just basically fast forward, each of those triplets will code for an amino acid as you can see there. The purple blobs represent the amino acid in this section. So DNA is made of sections called exons, which are protein coding sections, and introns, which are non-coding sections. During transcription, the code from both exons and introns is found in the pre-mRNA. The non-functioning introns are later removed from the sequence of the pre-mRNA, and the remaining exons are joined together by splicing to form mature mRNA strands, and that's what's shown here in this diagram. This image has been taken from the Khan Academy website, so please feel free to have a look at their video if you think you need some extra information on this. The exon sections can be joined together in a variety of combinations and orders, so the same sequence of DNA can code for several different proteins, but I'm not going to talk about that just now.
The next stage is to look at translation. Now, in both eukaryotes and prokaryotes, translation occurs at the ribosomes in the cytoplasm. Ribosomes are made up of complex ribosomal RNA and proteins, and they exist as two separate subunits until they are attracted to a binding site on the mRNA molecule when they join together. Ribosomes have binding sites that attract transfer RNA molecules loaded with amino acids. This Transfer RNA molecules are this clover-shaped molecule that you can see on the screen, which are about 80 or so nucleotides in length. A tRNA molecule has a longer arm on one end where you would find an amino acid attached, and at the bottom you have something called an anticodon region, which is the site of a three-base sequence that is complementary to the codon on the mRNA molecule. There is a different tRNA molecule for each of the different possible anticodons. In this diagram, I've got the amino acid of alanine at the top of the long arm of the tRNA molecule. Usually the codon of GCA would code for alanine, so the anticodon has to be the opposite of that, hence it is CGU on this example. I would just like to add as well that there are going to be different triplet codes that code for alanine. I've just used CGU as an example for here. During translation, amino acids are joined together to make a polypeptide chain or a protein, and that follows the sequence of codons carried on the mRNA. So let's have a look at translation in diagrammatical format so you can start to understand exactly what's going on. So the mRNA that you can see in the center of your screen over here has attached itself to the ribosome that you can see in those gray blobs. The tRNA molecules carry the amino acids to the mRNA. Please note that in this particular part of the video, I haven't put the anticodon section in to the video because it was just becoming too busy. So I've kept it quite simple and hopefully you should be able to understand what's going on. The tRNA molecule with the complementary anticodon will attach to the first codon on the mRNA. The second tRNA molecule will attach to the second codon. And the two amino acids will join by a peptide bond, and the first tRNA molecule has already moved away. Then another tRNA molecule will come along and attach to the next codon on the mRNA, and its amino acid will join the second amino acid by a peptide bond. This process continues to occur, producing a polypeptide chain, and it will continue until there is a stop signal on the mRNA molecule. So you can see here that the ribosome is simply just moving across, reading the mRNA at every codon. The process continues producing a polypeptide chain until there is a stop signal on the mRNA molecule. And you can see here where it's reached the stop signal of UGA. Whilst this diagram shows just the one ribosome working on the mRNA chain, you can get several ribosomes working on it, which increases the rate of protein synthesis. The chain will of course fold up in its secondary and tertiary shape, dependent on the chain of amino acids and where ionic bonds and disulfide bridges can form. I should mention that this process needs energy. Energy is used to activate the tRNA molecules, bind the tRNAs to the mRNA, and also elongate the peptide chain. Don't forget that the peptide bonds are formed through condensation reactions as well. So the next couple of slides are the word descriptions of the stages of transcription. I did have one student tell me they found it really hard to word the stages, that they understood what was going on in terms of protein synthesis, but to put it down on paper was a bit of a challenge. So this is a version that you might find really helpful. You might want to pause the video at this stage to write this bit down in your revision. The next part is also looking at translation. So again, feel free to pause the video and write this in your revision notes. I hope that was super useful for everyone. I wanted to share some important resources with you as well on my test shop. So what I've done is I've uploaded the past paper questions on protein synthesis on my test shop. You can find the link in the description of this video or search for TES BioTeach London on Google and the shop should come up and you should be able to download everything for free. Thank you so much for watching and feel free to leave me any questions if you need any more help on this particular topic. Bye for now.